Mike was the founder of the British political party Justice for Men and Boys in 2013 and continues to lead it. He rem it remains the only party in the English-speaking world campaigning for the rights of men and boys on many fronts. He's the author of 10 books, including one on the institution of marriage, The Fraud of the Rings, Fraud of the Rings 2009, and Feminism, The Ugly Truth 2012. Uh, Mike Buchanan. Robert. Oh, just a moment. Okay. I'd like to start with a story about one person's experience of coming out publicly as a men's rights advocate or activist and an MRA. Three days ago, I was walking near my hotel just down the road, and I passed some men working on a construction site in the rain. I couldn't help but notice that in Australia, as in other countries I visited, the patriarchy forbids women to do construction work. <laughs> Absolutely scandalous. You should be ashamed of yourselves. One of the men saw my shirt bearing the name of my party and correctly assumed I had something to do with the conference. He came up to me and said he'd seen an amazing young Canadian woman with short hair on Sky News, and he hoped we'd, we'd, we'd have a great conference. The amazing young Canadian woman with short hair is, it hardly need be said, Car Karen Strawn. Um, less well known, perhaps, is that she owns the world's largest private collection of vests. <laughs> Most of it stored in a vast purpose-built climate-controlled warehouse on the outskirts of Edmonton, but I, I digress. Um, a couple of months after last year's London conference, Karen posted a deeply, deeply moving audio piece on her YouTube channel. It's titled Coming Out, and it's 22 minutes long and very well worth catching for any of you who haven't caught it. Karen related that in 2013, after she'd been writing pieces for A Voice for Men as Girl Writes What for some time, her editor emailed her, asking if she were willing to reveal her real name in her byline. The following few sentences are her own words. I remember that morning well. I was one sip into a large cup of coffee, and I just stared, and stared, and stared at the message. My heart was pounding. My real name? That's my real life. I told my editor I'd think about it. Then I realized that if no one was willing to do that, to put their name on it, to put their face on it, to put their reputation on it, if no one was willing to actually come out, nothing was ever going to change. That's the end of Karen's words. Um, so a few hours after receiving the request, Karen agreed for her name to be in her byline on the website. With the benefit of hindsight, it was an important decision for the men's rights movement that she did that. Karen explained in her talk that despite her understandable fears, there had been no negative consequences to coming out, other than the loss of a few friends who hadn't meant much to her anyway. <laughs> um, I think a lot of us can echo that sentiment. And there had been a number of positive consequences. Later in the same audio piece, Karen says this. You know, with every person who comes out unashamedly, unabashedly, unapologetically, the road for everyone else becomes smoother and less steep. End of Karen's words. I'd, I'd go even further than Karen. As a class, men and boys have been suffering human rights violations at the hands of states for decades, although men collectively pay three quarters of the income taxes, which largely fund the states, uh, in, the, in the UK at least. People should be coming out as MRAs, not just unashamedly, unabashedly, and unapologetically, but proudly and defiantly. My talk title today is Let's Get Visible Beyond Keyboard Activism. I'll be using the term keyboard activism very, very loosely today to include all personal online engagement with men's issues and everything that relates to that, for example, feminism and, and gynocentrism. 
So I'm thinking of activities such as online reading and writing, as well as making and watching videos, making and listening to audio files. Many people in this room today, and many who will later <coughs> pardon me, watch the conference videos, spend a good deal of time every week on some of these, on some of these uh, activities. The sum total of time and energy and effort spent on online activities by all the people interested in men's issues globally is absolutely colossal. But the, ab the abuses of men's and boys' human rights happen offline. And I'm sorry to say that, at least so far, online activities have had little or no impact in the real world, the offline world. A big question for all of us is this. What can be done in the real world, as opposed to online, to end the assaults on the human rights of men and boys? And to answer that question, we must first remind ourselves where those assaults are coming from. It's very clear, it's the actions and inactions of the state which have led to so many of the problems facing men and boys. Feminists have manipulated the political class, as well as other classes, for decades in many countries, and certainly in the UK and uh, I suspect Australia, they've become a cornerstone of those countries' establishments. Feminists' influence only grows with every passing year, despite the online backlash against them. In the UK, more and more feminist politicians are taking ministerial and, and other senior positions, enabled, enabled by Prime Minister Theresa May, who infamously posed for photographs some years ago whilst wearing a T-shirt produced by the radical feminist organisation, the Fawcett Society. It bore, the, it bore the logo, this is what a feminist looks like. And this was a conservative politician. There are 650 MPs in the British House of Commons. Only one, Philip Davis, a conservative MP and hero of mine, and many, as I suspect, in this hall. Only Philip Davis is prepared to publicly criticize feminists. He spoke at the London conference last year, and the left-wing media later attacked him viciously for it. But that, that, that clearly didn't bother him in the slightest, I'm pleased to say. He gets private support from MPs in all parties, but not one will support him publicly. Not one. Six months ago, Philip Davis was elected unopposed to the Women and Equalities Committee. <laughs> now, I count that as one of the happiest days of my life. I have to <laughs> it's up there with the birth of my kids, quite frankly. <laughs> We've just had a general election in the UK, and Philip Davis was challenged by Sophie Walker, that's a good response, good response to that name. Sophie Walker is the leader of the Women's Equality Party and the winner of two of our Lying Feminist of the Month awards. The challenge, the, the, the challenge in Shipley, that constituency, was presented by feminists as, as courageous women fighting a, sexist mis, fighting a sexist misogynist, although, of course, Davis is neither a sexist nor a misogynist. Compared with the election in 2015, just two years ago, and despite the uh, challenge by Sophie Walker, Davis increased both, both his vote, vote count and percentage of votes cast, getting over 27,000 votes, 51% of all votes cast. <clears throat> the hapless Sophie Walker, meanwhile, got, got a little over 1,000 votes, and Julie lost her deposit. Now, hopefully, Davis's, Philip Davis's colleagues, particularly in the Conservative Party, will get the message that they can criticise feminists and their actions publicly and not lose their seats as a result. Now, it's not just, of course, female politicians and those who pandered to their demands who are to blame for the many crises facing men and boys today. We find the problem in many walks of life. For example, the judiciary, which is still largely male, although it's becoming less so, operates on highly gynocentric lines. As the blogger William Collins has explained, if men were treated as leniently as women in prison sentencing terms, five out of six men currently in British prisons would not be there. Gender equality in prison sentencing would end the prison overcrowding crisis in no time, so needless to say, feminists are not campaigning for that. 
I strongly recommend William's blog, William Collins's blog, to people all the time. It's mra-uk.co.uk. To my mind, William Collins has set the gold standard in articles about individual men's issues. I regret to say things in the coming years are going to get a lot worse for men and boys. Why? Because some women have an utterly insatiable appetite for power and privilege, and feminists deliver it to them at the cost of men's human rights and so much more. And frankly, in part because women as a class fight harder, harder for their privileges than men as a class are willing to fight for their basic human rights. To illustrate the point about power and privilege, I turn, perhaps surprisingly, to a story about women's soccer in the UK. But I need to start with the Australian women's soccer team, gloriously called the Matildas. They're ranked, the Matildas are ranked number five in the world and made it to the quarterfinals of the last three World Cups. I'm sure you caught all three. In, in May last year, the Matildas were thumped 7-0 by the Newcastle Jets under, 15 boys, under 15's boys team. This is an excerpt from an, an Australian newspaper article. Former Matildas player Joey Peters responded to news of the 7-0 loss by questioning, questioning efforts of the team's management to protect the team's brand, I, brand integrity in holding such a feature. I just thought the Matildas brand might be a little more protected than being exposed in that manner, <laughs> Peters said. <laughs> oh, God, I love that sentence. Um, you, you couldn't make it up, could you? Um, let's be honest and admit you'll see superior and more entertaining soccer played by males than by females. But of course, female players in soccer, as in many other sports, are demanding ever more money be diverted to them from the men's game, which perhaps explains at Wimbledon why, why they, they, they play for half the time and get the same damn prize money. Um, this leads me to the UK and a feminist politician's manipulations that would have caused absolute outrage in the mainstream media just a few years ago. And bear in mind, this is happening with a conservative government in place. Tracy Crouch was made Minister for Sport two years ago. She publicly threatened the Football Association, saying it would lose 30 to 40 million pounds of state funding, that's equivalent to about 50 to 70 million Australian dollars, if it failed to modernise. The word modernise is, of course, one of many weasel words, which ultimately mean that men in positions of power and responsibility must be thrown on the scrap heap, regardless of their merit and the relative merits or otherwise of the people, usually women, who replace them. Now, one of the demands made by Tracy Crouch was the reservation of three positions on the 10-member FA board, Football Association board, for female members by next year. And needless to say, her demands were accepted without criticism in the mainstream media or across football, it was, it was appalling, but it's a sign of the times. Now, there's currently only one woman on the FA board, Heather Rabatz. She was the only woman on the board also in January 2013, a month before I launched Justice for Men and Boys. She and I were interviewed that month on the flagship BBC television program, The Daily, Bol the, the, the Daily Politics. The video piece is on our YouTube channel. My main contribution to the discussion was to challenge the government's policy of bullying FTSE 100 companies into doubling the proportion of women on their boards from 12.5 to 25%. The reason I was challenging it was because even then, five years ago, there was emerging strong evidence from several countries of a causal link between increasing female representation on boards and corporate financial decline. Predictably, neither Heather Rabatz nor the feminist interviewer wished to engage with that evidence. And I found exactly the same with the parliamentary inquiry, so there we go. Um, I, I made the point to Heather Rabatz that I only ever saw feminists campaigning for more women to go into prestigious or well-paid positions in pleasant surroundings, such as in parliament or in uh, company boardrooms. And I wondered why there were no feminist campaigns for 50% of lorry drivers to be female. After a rather silly response to that question, Heather Rabatz said the following about the issue of appointing more women to senior positions. And I must apologize in, in advance for inflicting on you her mangling of the English language. I'll try not to laugh during it. <coughs> I might fail. Um, Heather Rabatz, okay. 
What we're talking about here, however, is power. Actually, most people give up power with great difficulty. This is about ensuring that power, whether it's around effective decision-making around our companies, has the best possible talent. I have to repeat that because it's so mangled. I mean, I don't, however many times I read it, it makes no sense. This is about ensuring that power, whether it's around effective decision-making around our companies, has the best possible talent. And my belief is that when I meet many, many women, they say, we'd really like to become non-executive directors, but we don't have the confidence. We don't know how to do it. I'd like to be a physicist, but I don't know how to do it. Um, <laughs> just wonderful. Um, and so she finished with, um, I don't find the same comments from my male colleagues, which I'd rather like. Now, this was um, a surprisingly, sorry, that's the end of the quote. So th this was actually, with the benefit of hindsight, a fairly rare example of a feminist in the mainstream media no longer bothering with the, with the lie that increasing the number of women in senior positions has, has anything whatever to do with improving organizational performance. She effectively admitted it was nothing more than a power grab for women from men. Nothing more than that. I raised a paradox in my talk at the London conference last year. MRAs have, have published amazing materials online and continue to do so, but those materials have had little or no impact offline and the assaults on men's and boys' human rights increase with every passing year. Um, to my mind, that's partly because MRAs collectively haven't concentrated much of their firepower, their awesome firepower, on the relatively small number of individuals, senior politicians in particular, who have the power to end the state's assaults on men and boys. I'm going to talk today about changes that I believe could and hopefully will lead to the MRM becoming more visible to the general public leading to a virtuous circle of more mainstream media coverage, leading to better public awareness of men's issues. There are many, many ways in which people might come out as MRAs. Uh, but, for, but, but, but for some, there could be employment consequences of coming out as an anti-feminist or an MRA. So the focus of their efforts might need to remain anonymous and online. But many such people have skills that could greatly benefit the MRAs who do campaign publicly. Um, without their contributions becoming known to their employers or others. And they could still help, help spread the word, I mean, this might seem flippant, but for example, by wearing shirts with men's rights or anti-feminist slogans when away from the places they live and work. And you might be surprised at just how much attention simply wearing such a shirt can, can attract if you're out in, in the public. On my way here from the UK, I was wearing a shirt from the J4MB summer collection. But... <laughs> It never made it to the fashion pages. I don't know why, but there we go. Uh, but it bore the words, this is what an anti-feminist looks like. And it, had the, and it had the party's name and website address. At, at Heathrow and Sydney airports, I spotted hundreds of people checking, checking the text. Um, and I'd, I'd wager many, many of them had never encountered the term anti-feminist before. Most of those people seemed curious, while some of the women frowned at me. It's got to be said. <laughs> So, of course, I smiled at the women, which only made them frown even more deeply. So it was win-win, it was I think. <laughs> but the point is that just the simple act, I mean, it might seem over the top to call it an act of defiance, but, but just, just the act of wearing a shirt which says something about men's human rights or challenges feminism is an act which takes little or no effort and has a surprising impact in terms of visibility. The sentence, this is what an anti-feminist looks like, of course begs a question for anyone with an inquiring mind. If feminism is about gender equality, if feminism is about gender equality which most people st still seem to believe, why would, why would anyone wear a shirt declaring himself or herself an anti-feminist? The answer, of course, is that feminism isn't about gender equality, it's about gender privilege. Always has been, always will be. The shirt sparked off a number of conversations in the airports, and some people took the website address down, and I even had, uh, had, a, had a 10 pound donation from an Australian guy who'd seen the shirt at Sydney, so Sydney Airport, so that was nice. The vast majority of those interested in men's issues confine their activities to the on online world in what I call the men's rights bubble. But most people, the general public, overwhelmingly, they, they, they never enter that bubble and never will. 
So we're absolutely invisible to, to people you know, who, who, d who don't come to our world. To increase our visibility, much of the time and energy and effort currently spent online needs to be spent offline. People, and I certainly include myself in this, need to escape the men's rights bubble, spending less time preaching to and engaging with the converted, and less time challenging feminists online. Feminists are, of course, the ultimate unconvertibles. And I regret every damn second that I've engaged with them for the last 10 years, quite frankly. <laughs> um, MRAs have, ex have, have expended huge amounts of time and energy trying to get feminists to see sense, decade after decade, with very little or nothing to show for it. Now, there's an opportunity cost associated with, de with devoting time and energy to unproductive activities, because that time and energy could be better employed on productive activities. And in my view, it must be if we're going to move forward as a movement. Another reason I think we need to increasingly move our efforts online is that we can expect ever more blocking of men's rights websites and social media. Some important ones have already been taken down. And in the UK, some internet service providers uh, bar a voice for men, as well as our website and a number of others, claiming they're hate sites. Um, as, as the men's rights movement gains traction, our enemies will inevitably devote ever more time and resources to, siling us, to silencing us online. And Wikipedia, well, I'm a big fan of Wikipedia, but in terms of gender politics, it's long been corrupted by, by, by feminist editors. And, but I, I, I occasionally visit our, the, the J4MB Wikipedia page to see what kind of crazy stuff they've posted now. Um, so what, what kind of offline activities might people engage in? Well, obvious ways to in increase public awareness include the following. Um, some really low-tech stuff here, I'm pleased to say. Number one, door-to-door -door leafleting in the constituencies of politicians who won't, pu who won't publicly stand up for the rights of men and boys. Um, uh, the leaflets inviting people to cast their votes elsewhere at the next uh, election. So in the case of British MPs, that means 649 of the 650, the only exception being Philip Davis. Um, a quick word of, war of warning about door-to-door -door leafleting for any of you who've never, who've never done it. Um, I did quite a lot of it before, along with some great colleagues. I did a lot of it before the 2015 general election. And I strongly recommend pushing leaflets through letterboxes on top of a, of a wooden spatula to save your hands being attacked by crazy dogs and even cats on one occasion. We, we, we reckon we lost about one spatula for every 200 houses. I mean, there are, there are dogs who have no other excitement in life other than to try and, try and bite a hand off. Um, so what else could you do? Stickers and signage on motor vehicles. It's all about visibility. If you have something on a motor vehicle, you know, driving here and there, thousands of people will see it. What else could, you know, you get, you get a sort of a payback that you'll never get, uh, or seldom, or very few people get online. Posters in public places, literature in public places. Street protesting, including on International Men's Day, uh, 19th of November, as always. It sh should be one in all our diaries. And um, we left on our seats this morning copies of the leaflets we recently handed out during a protest outside the Thornhill Clinic. Um, a clinic in Luton carrying out non-therapeutic circumcision of male minors, male genital mutilation, MGM, in the name of religion or culture. If the people in this room won't protest outside places where the genitals of defenseless male minors as young as eight days old are being butchered in the name of religion <coughs> or culture, who will? Seriously, who the bloody hell will? Bringing legal actions, as we plan to do later this year, with our first private prosecution of a doctor. <coughs> for, for <clears throat> our first pr private prosecution of a doctor for performing MGM, a crime under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. We've, we've sent plenty of, uh, of freedom of information requests, and um, the government does not deny that in the UK MGM is illegal. And finally, civil disobedience. It hopefully goes without saying that printed materials should point readers to useful sources of information, which are many and varied, much of it online. We have a huge list of recommended sites on our own website. Our 80-page long 2015 general election manifesto, which is also on our website, showed that in almost all the 20 areas in which the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the, state, by the British state's actions and inactions, 
it's done to privilege women and girls. This is a zero-sum game. The human rights of men and boys are assaulted to privilege women and girls. It's that simple. As well as becoming more publicly visible in our support of men's human rights, I feel there's also a pressing need for more, for, for more men to meet up with like-minded men living in their vicinities, to get moral support, and to start working together. I recommend a British, initi uh, uh, I recommend a British initi initiative, Network for Men, that's networkformen.org, which has numerous local groups in the UK and contacts in other countries who'd like to start groups, certainly in Australia and the United States and Canada, and I know those for sure. If you've decided the time has come for you to become more active uh, offline, then Network for Men is for you. Whether you can offer time, skills, knowledge, funding, or all these things, if you, have, if you have some understanding of the issues facing men and boys, then I urge you to become a part of the solution by becoming a Network for Men contact. When we launched our party in 2013, two things we were hoping for happened almost immediately. We started to get mainstream media exposure, and a few days later, I had an interview on a BBC radio program with, with over seven million listeners. And we started to get donations on a scale well beyond what we'd seen before when we were campaigning other than as a political party. And the level of donations has increased steadily over the past four years, I'm, I'm pleased to say. We haven't had to, to run a crowdfunder for anything for two or three years now. And I only mention these points because I believe we're still at a stage where launching a new men's rights political party will attract mainstream media attention. And this brings me to Australia inevitably. Australia has an electoral system with features which make it far superior for small parties than Britain's first-past-the-post first system. Australia's electoral system uses preferential voting for all lower and upper houses, uh, upper house elections with the exception of Tasmania, combining it with proportional representation in a system known as the single transferable vote. And astonishingly to, anyone, to any Brit, voting is compulsory for all. I, I can only assume vast numbers of people spoil their ballot papers. I don't, I don't quite know. Yeah, OK. <laughs> OK, so, okay. so voting is compulsory for all enrolled citizens in, in every jurisdiction. Um, I strongly urge Australians to launch the next Men's Rights Party and inject Aussie grit, determination, and yes, the, the trademark Aussie humour into the war for men's human rights. I've no, I've no doubt that if they do, they and the rest of us will be delighted with the consequences. I hope many of you who haven't yet come out publicly as MRAs will do so in the coming days and weeks. I hope more people will move away from their keyboards, engaging face-to-face -face with other MRAs, and devoting more time to activities which will increase public awareness of men's issues and starting, starting to put more heat on politicians in particular. We need, uh, echoing a point one or two of the other speakers made, we need individual politicians to fear the career implications of not defending the human rights of men and boys and challenging feminists. I believe the future is bright for the men's human rights movement if these things happen. And finally, this conference, I'm, I'm pleased to say, has been as much a resounding success as the last two. And um, I hope to see some of you at next year's conference wherever and whenever that is. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for mentioning our Australian electoral system, preferential voting and compulsory voting, and uh, the reminder of how effective for democracy it is, and also for the opportunities for us. Back to the uh, main question. Um, the issue of coming out, fantastic. To me, coming out means coming out as a half-witted, woman-hating bigot who doesn't care if his daughters um, get beaten up um, by men and doesn't want his boy to uh, respect women. That's, uh, if I was to um, 
acknowledge support for men's rights. Um, that is how I would be seen. Well, um, that's... And, sorry. Uh, yeah. Come in, uh, automatic. That's the label. Um, Woman-hating, half-witted, bigot who um, doesn't care if his daughters get beaten up and want, doesn't want his boy to respect women. Um, so, but to me there's a mid-ground between the echo chamber of the blogs and YouTube and uh, talking to my family. And that's Facebook, where there is my real name and uh, what I've done in the past a couple of times, if I see a newspaper article, Bettina Arndt, um, I see something that I like, um, the, uh, the red pill is to say I like this and say a few words about it and cop the flack. Um, so to me, Facebook with your real name is between the echo chamber um, and real life. Is there any value in that? I think we... <laughs> You know, you really, we, we, we really cannot allow our enemies, you know, to, to, to control the narrative. And part of that is that, is that we're willing to argue with them. We, 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 we had, um, we, we've been, our number one campaign for, I suppose, 18 months or more has been male genital mutilation. And we, of course, had the inevitable accusations of, of, of anti-Semitism. And we just have to take those on the chin and say, well, obviously, we're not anti-Semitic. You will not find a sentence I have ever spoken, n nothing in any of my books, nothing in the, the blogs. Um, it, you know, you really, you know, we, we have to sort of stop worrying so much. I mean, the, as Karen Strawn said, she had these, she was very worried in 2013 as to what the consequences could be. Um, and it, it, was all, it was all good. And, you know, I mean, if, if you know, if, if, these people hate us. Well, why would we let them control the narrative, for God's sake? Really, we, 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 you know, we need to come out proudly and say, you know, uh, we aren't women haters. Being anti-feminist is not being anti-women. And, you know, if, if the people in this room won't say that, you know. Specifically Facebook. Uh, well, I mean, I, mean, I mean, the thing about, you know, it'd be great if on Facebook or anywhere else, you know, you, you could use your, use your real name. Because I mean, people, you know, people, you know it, it does take a certain number of people to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to use my real name online, um, and you know, it, it'll snowball. You know, it's, uh, you know, once a thousand people do it, what, what, you know, what, what are the feminists going to do, really? Hi, but um, but but, but, if, but you know, if that fear stops us, then we've lost. And you know, I'm kind of tired of losing. You know, it's you know, it's, it, it, we are going to get some victories soon. It might start with MGM in the UK. I don't know, but you know, we we really just have to sort of stand up. And yes, it, it does take some courage. I mean, uh, I'm not saying it doesn't. You know, and some some people will will never be able to take that step. But uh, people need to you know. A little bit of the sort of Churchillian spirit, I think. Just before moving on to the next question, I just had one comment. My name is Robert Brockway, B-R-O-C-K-W-A-Y. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I like the um, low-tech activism idea, as in wearing a T-shirt can sometimes be more effective than thousands of comments left on uh, the internet. Um, an idea on that would be to have a central database of printable um, leaflets, for example, posters, that in, no matter where, what country you're in, you can actually access that stuff, get it made up, and, and get it out there. No, I agree. So, for example, you know, the, the MGM leaflets, you know, I'd be happy to, to email over anybody, to anybody the, the, the Word you know, version of that. For, for people to use locally, and I think, that, I think that's a great idea. Yep, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, other stuff as well that's uh, not sp specific per country. Um, and the second thing, if anyone in WA who I haven't spoken to um, already can come and say hello and uh, uh, go on the Network for Men site, because I don't think there's many of us um, on that. So 
if you can go on that and uh, put your name on so we can find each other. Okay. Um, I just wanted to point out that we do have a party that deals with some of these issues. They're called the Non-Custodial Parents Party. That's generally father's issues, but we do sort of have a party that deals with some of these. Um, um, I would just like to request that there could be time given to the audience and the people here to just maybe for the people that would want to talk about something, express something, offer a viewpoint which hasn't been talked about yet, that maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes could be just devoted towards that. Well, and this, well, so I mean, I mean, I, I'm not the organizer. AVFMR. Um, okay. But, but 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 you know, there, there is a timetable, and um, I realise that. But I just yeah. think there would be probably some really great value about that. My one point upon that would be um, what I've heard equated here a lot is linking um, feminism towards a Marxist ideology. Now, that's what the feminists do towards capitalism. They say that everything which is patriarchal and bad is because of capitalism. I think that's a really stupid strategy. It's going to alienate a lot of people that need not be. This is not an economic argument. This is about fairness. This is about justice. Whether you're in a communist country, whether you're in a capitalist country, I just think it's one point that I've heard again and again and again and I just, I just wanted to make it public because I've not heard anyone else really kind of point to it. Well, I, th I think, I, I, I don't know if this will answer your, your, your point, but Erin Pitsy, I think, put it rather nicely that, 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 that for Marxists, you know, there's a, there's, there's a bourgeoisie and they oppress the proletariat. And, and her position, I hope I'm not, I don't think I'm misrep misrepresenting her, is that the feminists just moved the goalposts. So the oppressing class was men, all men, and the, the oppressed class, all women. So, so I don't think feminists kind of say this is. A, a, I mean, some of them may say may talk about capitalism, but 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 I haven't heard feminists talk too much about it, about economics. It tends to be just gender, at least at least you know that I've encountered. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Um, look, I've been involved with um, quite a number of men's organisations. We've been quite visible for quite a number of years now in Australia, but a slightly different approach. Um, I've done a lot of journalism, a lot of writing, and, and put myself out there. And there seems to be there's activism and then there's advocacy. I'm starting to wonder if there's room for them all. And the groups I'm involved with, we've made a lot of progress in the public sphere by not tackling feminism head on, by actually offering a better solution. And what's actually happened is um, we sort of been aware there's quite a, a quite a vast amount of public support out there that's getting very tired of the gender battle. They don't they're, they're tired of this whole men versus women thing, and they're actually looking for a better way. Uh, two years ago, we had a big anti-domestic violence march here on the Gold Coast. And the whole theme was say no to domestic violence. One of the guys in our men's group came up with a huge banner that said, "Men say yes to family peace." We got up the front, and everyone said, "Wow, that's fantastic." And we got asked to lead the march. We were on TV news that night and whatever, and we got quite broad acceptance because we came up with a better solution rather than antagonism. I'm wondering if there isn't like a, a, a place for that as well, rather than for trying to fight something. Sure, there's a place for that, but also the, one, the, the men who don't really want to get involved in uh, the heavy-duty stuff. There's a broad amount of the public out there that's really looking for... A, a better solution rather than a gender battle. I just right. want your views on okay. that. Okay, but, but there's just a huge disconnect. At the end of the day, feminists get 99.9% .9 of domestic violence funding. You know, just just around the world, as far as I can see, and you know, and and you know, clever slogans and so on. And I take my hat off. That's that's a very clever thing. But how does that influence, you know, you know, the, uh, the money going to feminists, and how does that lead to money going to male victims and I, I just don't, I, I, you know, I think you have to target the political classes for that. It is, it is the state. It is the state. That's the problem. Adrian, do you have anyone, anyone on that side? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay, I'd say let that gentleman and the lady at the back here, and I think we'll be done. Um, if you're interested in the 
rude, crude, ignorant, incorrect uh, Aussie humour, I'd like to come out as a bastard. <laughs> and if you spell it with the broad Aussie accent with an R, so B-A-R-S-T-A-R-D, it actually stands for battling against reactionary stereotyping and retarded dykes. Um, although you've suggested moving away from uh, debating feminists most of the time, we do have an opportunity on the 20th of June on the ABC, uh, Triple J Hack Live Debate. And we'll have Karen, Karen Straw and Cassie J uh, and a lot of the guys from Men's Rights Sydney, for example, that are here today, debating people like Clementine Ford. <sighs> so Clementine Ford... You might have heard of her, the most notorious bully in Australia. Uh, I'm not looking forward to it because I'm anticipating that a lot of the time in the debate will be wasted listening to Clementine complain about all the horrible messages that she receives from people online. And she does receive some horrible stuff. But I don't... How do we shut that down so it doesn't waste too much time in the debate that, oh, you, you guys uh, shouldn't have your men's rights meetings and shouldn't carry on about the stuff you're interested in because all the... <laughs> <laughs> what was that? That's, that's that Aussie humour. Excellent, I like How that. Do we, oh, so Duct tape the solution to so many problems. So people send horrible messages to Clementine Ford and how do we get that out, what are your suggestions for getting that out of the way so it doesn't waste too much time in the debate? Because okay. I don't feel responsible for no, what no. people send to her. Okay. I, I mean, uh, perhaps I should have said that, you know, when I, when I talk about debating with feminists is a waste of time, perhaps I should have made it clearer that it's never a waste of time when Karen Strawn does it. Um, uh, but but 99.9% of people, and I certainly include myself in that, don't, don't have her skills. Um, and so, so, you know, the vast majority of people who do spend time um, engaging with feminists and debunking their stuff, it is, wh wh where does it go, you know? I mean, uh, 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 I mean, it seems to me that a lot of feminists only engage with MRAs online to, to, to drive the MRAs nuts. And, and, and they succeed. And, and for feminists, getting a, getting a man angry is a win. Whereas a, whereas a man, you know, presents rational argument after rational argument, Complete waste of time. But, uh, no, I, I think, you know, the people who really have an audience should, should, should carry on engaging with feminists. But I'd say the, over, the overwhelming majority of people, um, it, it, is, it is, I'm sorry, just a waste of time engaging with feminists. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I try not to do it online. I'll do it in, in uh, I don't know, TV or radio studio. Of course I will. But, but to go online to, to some obscure feminist blog, no. Won't do it. Do we have time for one more question or do we need to go? No, no. We've got the announcement and so forth. You've got the announcement? No, I'm going to do Okay, you coming up? I'm coming up to the